Hello, welcome to the ESRC Festival of Social Science. Uh, my name is James Brown. I work at the Warwick Institute of Engagement. Um, and I just want to uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, please do use the uh, chat box, which is down the side of the video. Um, if you're still watching this through the Eventbrite link, you might need to just click onto the YouTube link and see this in YouTube, but then you'll be able to see the chat box. And um, we do want to hear from you. So let us know where you're joining us from. Um, I'm in Birmingham at the moment. Um, it's a pretty uh, lovely day, actually. It's been really sunny. So let us know where uh, you're joining us from. Uh, do ask your questions as well. We'll have plenty of time at the end uh, of today's session to answer questions. So we do want to hear from you. So do make sure that you get involved. Um, there's loads of events going on this week as part of the festival. Uh, you can see all the Warwick uh, ones at warwick.ac.uk forward slash ESRC FOSS. Um, so we've got, still got plenty of events on tomorrow and on Saturday, uh, but you can also then see the wider um, festival programme as well. So there's still plenty are going on from other universities as well. So do check those out. Um, we've also on Twitter at Warwick Engages um, and there is a hashtag, uh, hashtag ESRC Festival, which you can follow as well. So uh, please do use the chat, do use Twitter, do get in touch. We want to uh, hear what you think um, and we want to know your questions and your thoughts. Um, but that is sort of enough from me. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. We've got some uh, fantastic speakers um, and it's a really fascinating story. I've had a little uh, sneak preview already um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing a lot more about it. Uh, so um, it's my uh, real pleasure to introduce Professor Richard Aldrich, um, who is um, a professor at University of Warwick. And he's going to uh, start us off with uh, the first part. So uh, Richard, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. And today we really want to answer the question, what happened after Bletchley Park? So we're going to tell you the story of something called Operation Rubicon, which is the biggest intelligence operation of the late 20th century, though in fact it actually ran on into the early 21st century. And it was all around trusted technology, which is something that we use today. So it's a highly relevant story. So what happened um, after Bletchley Park? What happened to the story of encryption and code breakers after the Second World War? And what can we learn from this story? Op Operation Rubicon was essentially Bletchley Park Mark II, but it worked rather differently to Bletchley Park. Operation Rubicon was essentially a deception, deception operation, a scam, a hustle, all based around trusted technology. And it was run by four countries, the United States, Germany, Sweden, and Switzerland. And what it did essentially was give those countries access to the communications of about 100 other countries around the world for about 50 years. And I think it's reasonable to say this is perhaps one of the most successful, surprising, remarkable intelligence operations um, of the last century. So how did this story come out? The story has been suspected by journalists and historians for many years, but over the last couple of years, new documents have surfaced in Germany. Um, they were made into a television program by the German TV company ZDF, and happily Warwick University, and particularly the, the cyber GRP, were asked to advise and comment on this. And it's caused a great furore in Europe. The Swiss government has just completed an inquiry into this episode this week. Why was it a controversial story? Quite simply because the most important um, cipher expert in the world, someone called Boris Hagelin, the top manufacturer of cipher machines, the successors to Enigma, essentially ran a factory in Switzerland called Crypto AJ. And this factory was famous for exporting really good cipher machines, machines that were trusted for their excellent technology and, of course, trusted because of their Swiss neutrality. But secretly, this guy, Boris Hagelin, had sold out. He'd done a deal with German intelligence, um, with the CIA. And although his machines boasted strong encryption, in fact, they only gave weak encryption. And so what that meant was all countries in the world who had really sophisticated computers could read these messages. 
So by the late 20th century, we have a club consisting of countries like Sweden, Switzerland, the United States, Germany, but also some other sort of outriders, Britain, the Netherlands, even Russia. Countries with good computers could read all these messages. Who were the victims? The victims of this scam, this hustle, which went on for 50 years, were mostly countries in the global south. They were countries like Argentina and Iran, but also countries like Italy, Greece and Spain. So a really fascinating situation in terms of the world of code breaking and trusted devices. This story is one that makes us really rethink the history of espionage over the last 50 years. It makes us rethink the history of espionage during the Cold War. Who were the real targets? Who were our real friends? Who were our enemies? And it also makes us begin to rethink who were the big players in Cold War espionage. Sometimes the little fish turn out to be the big fish. Sometimes the little fish turn out to be the whales. And um, that's certainly the case with countries like Sweden and Switzerland and also Germany. And we're now going to turn to Dr. Melina Dobson to tell us a little bit about the story of Germany. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to have you here um, on this uh, Thursday afternoon. Um, as Professor Richard Aldrich has said, this is the story of um, Operation Rubicon. And well, firstly, of course, we want to think about what do we know about intelligence operation during the 20th century? And well, predominantly, we hear, as um, Richard Aldrich has already said, about UK's Bletchley Park, for example. You may have even seen the imitation game telling the story of Alan Turing breaking the German Enigma machine in um, World War II. What do we know about intelligence operations during the Cold War? Well, similarly, the stories we are told predominantly continue to follow the developments and successes um, of Bletchley Park, and particularly, particularly the UK's involvement in the Five Eyes Alliance. That's the relationship between the five English speaking countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And they focus predominantly on what we call signals intelligence. So that's electronic signals or communication between people. And inevitably, we also see countless stories of activities of the United States intelligence services during this time. So mostly of activities of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, um, mainly focusing on what we call human intelligence, um, so human, um, so that is the kind of Mission Impossible, James Bond style um, activities. So much outside the consistent um, Cold War standoff between the US and, and the Soviet Union, we don't have that clear of a picture of what has been happening. We do hear, of course, about the KGB and the East German Stasi during the Cold War. But what we don't hear so much about is the West German intelligence services during this time. So obviously, when after a lot of investigative work by a group of journalists and academics, um, these documents were discovered um, in looking at West German involvement in this central um, project and partnership focusing on signals intelligence and Comsec, which is communication security, they knew they were dis that this was in an important discovery. And Operation Rubicon can be called a successful operation. It was the partnership between German in the German intelligence services, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, the BND, um, and the American CIA. And Sarah will tell you more about the CIA um, in a little bit. So. What was the role of Germany during this time? Well, Germany was central during um, during this time uh, in this partnership. And it throws up a lot of questions for intelligence scholars because um, it goes against the picture of a dominant and superior Anglosphere, so English speaking countries um, in the intelligence world during that time. What we've discovered is that Germany was very much ahead in, a, in the tech market um, through companies like Siemens. 
And the relationship between Crypto AG, the company that was created by Boris Harblin, and Siemens was central to the success of Operation Rubicon. And as a lot of the techni technical knowledge and support was provided by Siemens, um, and this sort of went on throughout the time, the development of Crypto AG, even before the partnership between um, the BND and the CIA. And it really developed um, quite uh, strong links to the point where staff were exchanged between Crypto AG and Siemens quite regularly. And this German tech success really begs the question, if Germany um, should perhaps be considered as an intelligence great power during the Cold War, much like the UK and the United States already are. And this could mean that the focus on English speaking countries should perhaps be, perhaps be shifted towards a Eurocentric intelligence in, into Euro, towards Eurocentric intelligence innovation. And this has been supported by the discovery of documents telling us about the Maximator Alliance, for example, between Denmark, Sweden, West Germany, France, and the Netherlands. And this was, um, again, a highly exclusive club, only permitting the most technically advanced countries within Europe. And Germany very much, West Germany was very much a part of that. And the questions we want to ask, or one of the questions we want to ask, is if Germany can be considered as an intelligence great power, should we then place greater responsibility on it to be ethically sound? And this is a question we have asked um, of some of the dominant dem democratic intelligence powers in the Anglosphere repeatedly. The United States um, in particular, for example, historically um, in the 1970s, we have repeatedly asked um, them to justify um, spying on their own citizens, for example. And most recently, of course, um, we've we've spoken about or we've heard about a little uh, known individual named Edward Snowden challenging some of America's surveillance practices. And Snowden um, appropriated 1.7 million documents from the NSA base on Hawaii and handed these to the Guardian, Guardian who subsequently published information on several surveillance programs through which um, the NSA and GCHQ were spying on American and British citizens. So our question is, is Operation Rubicon a forerunner um, to this story, to the story of um, Edward Snowden? Um, Germany in particular was actually outraged at uh, these uh, Snowden revelations, and not least because their own Chancellor Angela Merkel's phone was, was also uh, revealed to have been tapped by the United States. And so hopefully you can see that this uh, development is really significant um, in this story because it shows that um, Germany was a, a fundamental part of technical um, development. And so we need to question their ethical uh, standing in uh, future years. And one of the ways we do that is um, by looking at some of the specific instances um, within the story of Operation Rubicon. And one of these in particular is the way in which um, Crypto AG uh, was cutting out their employees in terms of not telling them that the uh, company was actually owned by the BND and the CIA. Um, Hans Buhler, who was a, an, an employee of Crypto AG, was one of the individual uh, salesmen who would frequently visit customers um, to service Crypto AG equipment abroad. In 1992, Hans Buhler made a round trip um, to Tehran in um, Iran. And his visit didn't go as planned. One Buhler wasn't aware of the fact that um, Crypto AG was owned um, by the intelligence services. And so when Bula didn't return um, from uh, Iran, inquiries were made um, by his sales department. And it turned out that Bula had been um, remanded in custody in Iran for around a month before his whereabouts um, were verified by the Swiss, Swiss authorities. 
And Bula remained in custody, um, suspected of espionage by the Iranian government. Um, in November 1992, he was eventually charged um, for unauthorized contact with military personnel um, and being in a receipt of military information, uh, bribery and illegal consumption of alcohol. And there was quite a lot of debate within Rubicon, within the Rubicon partnership when a ransom request was made um, by the Iranians for um, one million US dollars. And there were several attempts um, to source these funds. Um, eventually, uh, Bula was uh, released. And on, upon his release, um, he met um, some journalists at uh, the airport when he returned home. And immediately he started to say that um, he thought he had been part of um, a, uh, a plan by the intelligence agencies. So he was very close to revealing um, the, actual, the actual truth behind Crypto AG. And this really begs the question um, ethically of what Crypto AG were doing. Um, there was a number of these incidents, um, not, not only specifically with employees, but also the secrets that had been revealed by Crypto AG. Uh, and ethically, we need to ask the question um, whether this um, was in fact uh, justifiable at all in the name of gathering intelligence um, during this time. So just to conclude, um, before I hand over to Sarah Mainwaring, a PhD student at the University of Warwick, um, Germany was a central part of this operation. And because this has been established, we need to also ask certain questions about the powers that Germany has had and um, the uh, operation within um, the German intelligence services. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, good, good evening. Um, thank you for taking the uh, decision, I guess, to spend the evening with us and not watch the, uh, the British government give another press conference about COVID. Um, so, so far tonight, we've heard about how um, through Operation Rubicon, Bletchley Park may not be the end of the story. It may not be the final piece in this puzzle of understanding just how important codes, ciphers, um, encryption really is to um, our current day, but also to history. And what I was particularly taken with was, was this interest, this historic interest of governments and intelligence agencies in technology companies specifically the CIA, um, which also changes one of the important aspects of this story. Historically, we always consider the National Security Agency, the um, agency that Edward Snowden famously uh, declared loads of information about in 2013. We always think of them as the ones interested in breaking uh, iPhones, in hacking into systems to find out secrets. But actually, one of the most telling things about this whole story is that it was the CIA who were leading it. Um, they were intent on and almost adamant that owning a technology company really was an important aspect to not only the Cold War, but also to intelligence and American national security uh, throughout the 80s, 90s, and indeed into the 21st century. And that really encouraged me to kind of sit back and ask, well, why? Why would an intelligence agency, which historically we consider human intelligence as, you know, being made of the American James Bond, uh, full of people who just run around the Middle East and, you know, in the pursuance of American national security, well, why did they care about codes and ciphers? Why, as Richard mentioned earlier, did they want to know exactly what Argentina was saying to Iran during the 1970s? Why were they so interested in reading the uh, communications of over 150 countries throughout the Cold War. Now, to some, there's quite a rational explanation uh, to do with strategic advantage, understanding the enemy, all those kind of usual ideas. But actually, th what was really striking to me was that it kind of signified the importance of the private sector and the importance of telecommunications companies in all of this. Um, 
I mean, we hear in 2020 so much about government ownership of companies and so-called risky vendors like Huawei, for example. Um, you know, the US-China uh, uh, disagreement on these things is, is, is renowned uh, and, uh, in, in the press quite a lot these days. But actually, you know, this, this, this purchase of the company in 1970 occurred over 50 years ago. So I think one of the most interesting things about this story, as Melina mentioned, is that it does suggest that this, this interest in telecommunications companies this interest in what we now refer to as our iPhones and our laptops really does go back much farther than we perhaps realize. But why? You know, I mean, in some sense, it, 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 it's a straightforward question, but this was a global operation. It required the uh, CIA to maintain quite a difficult and at times uh, fractious relationship with the German intelligence agency. And it also called disagreements at home. The CIA uh, disagreed with the NSA on several occasions about just how much they should invest in this partnership. Um, which is another interesting dimension of the whole story, because the NSA really did just want to take a technical role. They didn't see the benefits of engaging with companies and the market for encryption and this kind of rising use of telecommunications lines throughout the 1980s and indeed in the 1990s. And maybe there's a lesson there, I suppose, you know, the history books will will um, will, will, will analyze that uh, for years to come. But what I really think is, is, is quite important about this whole thing is that relationship between companies and governments, if not intelligence agencies, um, not only with Crypto AG, but with Ericsson, with Samsung, um, arguably with Nokia as well. And what some, it's something that's kind of <coughs> uh, fed into some of my other research into this kind of intricate, if not difficult relationship between these two spheres. Um, it's a question we can consider in, in the Q&A afterwards, but just what does it mean for a government to have an interest in a telecommunications company, should they? Where do the boundaries between those things lie, given that so much of our data now um, is held within um, these private communication systems like, you know, at the Apple Cloud or Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, OneDrive, for example, just who should have control over that? Where, where does trust lie? And I really think that question underlines this whole story, because really the CIA and the Germans in making the decision to purchase the company ultimately undermined the trust of global communications in 1970. That's quite a polemic claim. But actually, I think when you lay down um, what happened, they really did do that. From 1970, um, designs were sent across Europe and indeed Latin America and Africa and elsewhere that really, you know, that, that did undermine the security of these systems and the customers often didn't know. Sometimes they did and there were several uh, revelations about the system, which Jason will go into um, in the latter half of this uh, presentation, but really we do have to consider that, you know, for years and years and years, governments, institutions like the UN, were using these systems and either knowingly, um, I would argue more often than not unknowingly, using insecure systems. And because it was partly because the Germans and the CIA, as I mentioned, had made the decision to buy this company and ultimately control, um, control the system. And I think that's a question really that, you know, no one can answer, particularly not in an hour um, setting like this. But I think it's an important one, especially as telecommunications, 5G, all those other things are becoming much more important. But really, you know, I guess that the one remaining question we have to ask answer is, well, how did they maintain this agreement? Um, We'll hear in the next part of this presentation that there were revelations, journalists revealed what was happening quite often, uh, budding customers did figure it out. But just how did they maintain the strategic global, you could almost call it a coup of encryption, because they really did undermine quite masterfully um, the communications of a whole load of uh, countries, institutions, and, and other bodies. So I'll now pass to Dr. Jason Dimidik, who will explore just how they maintain this in more detail. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you all for uh, tuning in this evening um, <clears throat> on this nice cold November evening. Um, so just as a bit of warning, now and again, I may slip into using CAG for um, Crypto AG, but um, I'm sure you'll quite quickly catch on to that. Um, so for me, one of the more fascinating aspects of Operation Rubicon was its resilience. Um, as Richard mentioned earlier, it lasted over 50 years. And um, yet on numerous occasions, knowledge of the operation um, and the vulnerabilities within um, Crypto AG were revealed um, either locally um, through kind of each 
customer kind of working things out as well as kind of nationally as well. Um, and within that, there were links between NSA's involvement within this rigging through um, these revelations. Somehow the operation continued and much of its success continued worldwide as well into the 90s and into the 2000s. Um, so some of these uh, messages were understood by the fact that such as um, with Libya, um, they realized that the communications were being read by the US and therefore um, started to make some complaints to Crypto AG saying that actually our machines are vulnerable, we need to change that. Some simple assurances and they were eased into buying some more. Whereas other kind of discoveries around this um, actually came through countries' own understanding of cryptography, especially during the 1970s and the early 1980s. Public encryption and cryptology generally was being disseminated to the public th thanks to the uh, likes of Martin Hellman, Whitfield Diffie, and many, many others around that period that were trying to bring it out of pri private areas and into um, kind of the use for the public sector and for individuals. Um, and this has been that actually a lot of CAG's customers started to understand a bit more about how their... Um, communications could be broken, how they could be threatened by others. And they started to realize that their machines weren't as strong as were promised. And again, they would make these complaints to um, Crypto AG that actually you, you're mis-selling us this stuff, but they didn't necessarily put the links towards the fact that this was purposeful and a bigger intelligence operation, but more just down to the fact that actually it was cheaper and they were making a bit more money, which made a bit of business sense, you could say. But <clears throat> Thirdly on this, we also had journalistic publication around um, the operation. And there were three major examples within this, within um, the period of Rubicon that increasingly revealed more and increased the links from Crypto AG to the NSA in particular. So um, uh, the likes of Ronald Clark in 1979, who even though he misinterpreted um, a lot of the evidence within Boris Hagelin, the founder of Crypto AG's correspondence to um, the NSA stalwart, uh, William Friedman. Um, their correspondence gave away quite a lot around the relationship here. Um, Clark, unfortunately, misinterpreted this, yet it still kept NSA on their toes. And they were quite anxious about what would then get revealed from this. And they attempted to try and... Um, <clears throat> restrict some of the access to the archives and the correspondence that was then publicly available in the um, Virginia Military Institute Library at the, um, the Marshall Carter Library. Um, but then only three years later, James Bamford in his um, Puzzle Palace that blew the lid on NSA to all intents and purposes went a bit further and managed to kind of realise that actually this correspondence meant quite a bit more. Although he couldn't prove this um, fully, he could kind of guesstimate that actually the Boris project linked to all these meetings between um, Boris Hagelin and William Friedman. And the code around that might not necessarily have been as strong as it could have been, um, since it was just written down as the Boris project within the files there. Um, but it still wasn't quite enough. And we could still see from the evidence we're seeing today that this operation continued successfully afterwards. Um, it wasn't until the 1990s when um, Scott Shane at the Baltimore Sun, along with uh, the defense correspondent um, Tom Bowman, published their series, No Such Agency. Um, in particular, the article um, titled Rigging the Game, where they brought documentary proof of um, attendance of NSA personnel at CAG board meetings, board meetings in the late 1970s, um, as well as bringing in further kind of interview and quotes and other kind of um, testimonies from Crypto AG employees at the time, they were able to really put um, a good frame around Operation Rubicon in all but name at this point, that the NSA was involved in rigging these machines. Um, although, as we found out, and as Sarah mentioned, it was more from this technological capability, this technical capability within that. Um, <clears throat> but the likes of Bueller's story and the fact that Scott Shane then kind of disseminated this worldwide, then um, we start to see that 
actually these links are quite firm now. Yet even after 1995, the operation continued um, past the millennium and up until roughly 2018. Um, yet somehow throughout all of this, as I've just said, it continued even after all these revelations. And some one, some of the countries like um, Iran, uh, Libya and such continued buying these products and they continued to flourish um, Crypto AG's portfolio at the time. Um, maybe the biggest loss that we've seen evidence for through the 1980s was that of Egypt, um, who didn't quite want to take the risk of these increased vulnerabilities. But the answers within this generally sit, seem to show themselves best within the case of Argentina. Um, Argentina, um, on numerous occasions, were either um, managed to work out that there were vulnerabilities and links that um, other countries were able to read their correspondence and that maybe there was a more kind of malicious term within this. Um, at the time, um, flying to Argentina, if, especially if uh, the government wasn't particularly happy with you for something you've done, might not have been the safest um, for anyone because during the 70s and 80s, it was the uh, dirty war and many, many people went missing who disagreed with the government and their location and such is still in an ongoing inquiry and such. Yet the CEO was summoned to Argentina um, where he was unsurprisingly quite fearful of what might happen to him out there. But instead of punishing or threatening the company, what the Argentinian government really wanted was to exploit these vulnerabilities for their own um, purposes. They wanted to exploit the exploitation and make their promise to Crypto AG was we'll, we'll keep quiet about these vulnerabilities so long as you don't tell our neighbours, in particular Chile. And it starts to show that actually geopolitical exploitation of these rig machines was much more important to some countries than um, actually this... Uh, hegemonic intelligence threat from kind of these global powers. Um, and we're likely to kind of see this again as more and more evidence comes through, whether that is from regional perspectives and trying to use um, these machines on the um, assurances of the companies such as Crypto AG, um, or maybe even for their own kind of other counterintelligence purposes as well. Yeah. Um, the other reason we start to see is also the kind of cost of cryptology. Um, encrypting your codes, creating your own machines and such, and having that knowledge of public key encryption or anything along these lines is pretty expensive and a big investment to start up in the first place, let alone then upkeeping, upgrading and meeting all the new threats. So we start to see that it actually becomes cheaper to buy um, these kind of products privately from firms who are making them and assuring you that they are safe, especially when you're going to a company such as Crypto AG, you have the backing of the CIA and the BND um, with funds being able to get into the market and such, as well as technological designs, um, which helps keep the costs down. So you start to see that um, actually the price within this is also having an effect on certain countries and maybe that is why we see that the majority of con the consumers of crypto ag products were generally from the global south where intelligence wasn't necessarily um as important to their kind of politics at the time um which then kind of then starts to lead us back to the fact to the questions we've started asking from the beginning. So since Rubicon was revealed on multiple occasions in the press or generally through being tipped off through their own knowledge and such, yet the operation continued and quite successfully. So we once again kind of ask, can we be certain of the assurances that we are given around the terms of privacy, the amount of security we're given from tech giants today, whether it be that Apple, Google, Facebook, Huawei, or is this then is this more than just a conspiracy theory? Are there now kind of trends behind behind this now that show that actually we do need to take care when moving forward around these links between government and private companies? Um, now I'll hand you back over to James um, where we'll take some questions, I believe. Um, thank you so much for your time. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so uh, what we'll do now, we'll invite everyone back on screen
um, and we will uh, have a look at some questions. We've got a couple um, from the audience and one from myself as well. Um, but I wonder, just to sort of start us off, um, I find it really interesting, this idea of, of you know, this, like you say, the, it requires this collaboration between governments and sort of private industry. Um, and I just wonder if you've got thoughts on the uh, on what that was like, sort of perhaps historically, perhaps with governments being a bit more powerful than perhaps industry, whereas now we've got some of these massive national corporations, which potentially are certainly bigger and sort of more powerful than some governments. Um, I wonder if that's had a much of an effect or a change or, or how you see that. Shall I take that one? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think it's actually more or less the bigger argument of my whole PhD. Um, this idea that in the 1950s, um, it was governments who were leading this policy. They were um, work, still working with the private sector. They definitely still relied on them to a point, but they had much more autonomy. Um, and I would suggest that maybe two things maybe led that development or shift. Um, the first one being the development of global markets for these products, um, which really led to you know, the growth of companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft was the first one perhaps to, to suggest that was where it was going to go. <laughs> you know, the launch of Windows 95 really did begin to change things. Um, technolo technologists do seem to think. So I think there's that kind of more bigger structural change. Um, with the emergence of markets, which just meant governments did have to listen to companies because they relied on companies for their national economic security and so did want companies to go and sell their products overseas. So they did just have to kind of rebalance that situation. And then the second one, I think, and the others could probably speak to this too, is the idea of trust in these bodies and trust in these agencies. Since about the 1970s, particularly in America, there were several examples that kind of showed the population and, and customers, you could argue, that maybe they shouldn't trust their intelligence agencies. You know, Watergate is a prime example, Snowden's, Melina mentioned, and, and there are others. So I think maybe those two things work together. Um, whether they were intentional, you, you can't say, but I think there's probably those two. Um, they'd be my starter for 10. And I, I think you could, um, you could point to corporations like IBM which all the way through their history really have had a close relationship with um, the American government. But what's changing now is that, as you say, these corporations are now so powerful. So the United States perhaps sees companies like Microsoft as part of American cyber power, part of America's footprint in the world. But Microsoft doesn't necessarily see itself as part of American power. Microsoft almost sees itself as its own state. And um, the CEO of, of Microsoft has pretty much, Brad Smith, has pretty much said the same thing publicly. He's like, well, actually, maybe the American public ought to trust Microsoft a little bit more than they trust um, the American government. But we're getting into some very interesting times now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just to add to that, um, I think, you know, what Sarah and Richard have said are absolutely, um, absolutely right and completely agree with that. Um, and additionally, I think we're just, we're relying on technology so much more now. It's everywhere. Uh, and I think it's made that, um, that idea of trust that Sarah uh, brought up is, is really interesting because it goes further than that now. We're, we're relying on it um almost on on a daily basis right we've always got our phones with us um every time we're logging into the internet every time we're having to do um online seminars or tutorials or lectures um and uh, every time we go and pay with our credit cards and debit cards everything is connected um and i think it's kind of brought about um a sort of almost um post trust um atmosphere because we're not we're not even thinking about that anymore we're just using these technologies especially younger people um who are um who, who are who have grown up with that just do, they do use that on the other hand of course it has also allowed us to get a better understanding of what these technologies are actually about um so actually um in in another way the internet has kind of brought us closer to understanding how these work how these technologies actually work um, and I know certainly my students like to, um, you know, explore that further and um, examine that particular um, avenue further. So, yeah. And to just kind of 
continue this theme on trust, um, we're actually starting to see the intelligence agencies in the public relations um, starting to come out more around that to try and build this trust within some of the technology that we're seeing, help companies to, especially smaller companies, to help design their own kind of security frame. We see the National Cyber Security Centre in particular um, in the news quite often, be that from stopping um, denial of service attacks or realising um, when things are being sold or other exploitations going on and helping make people aware. So we're starting to see um, intelligence agencies take a greater public footing um, within this area of trust and helping people to kind of help themselves moving forward in how to protect themselves from um, whether it's criminality or from kind of greater kind of intelligence or influence um, scams as we been hearing a lot about in the recent elections and such. Yeah, so we've got some good questions now in the chat coming from the audience. So um, we'll, we'll start with this one from Ishara because um, this sort of, again, touches on some of those same things of trust. Um, so how much should we trust mm -hmm. current claims about things like end-to-end -end encryption, etc.? Is there a third party who reviews such claims? That, that That's quite a question, um, which we could probably talk all night about, actually. I mean, I think ultimately we should trust the, the companies to a point. Um, I think the debate between over end to end encryption is often, I don't want to say blown out of proportion, but it's all, often polarized. Um, if you look historically, there were, if not still are, some examples of um, them using a trusted third party to store documents so that, you know, there was a capacity. But, but I think we can think of end to end encryption slightly differently because you know, the so-called access to encryption, encrypted data happens everywhere on the internet. If you've used a password reset, you have gone through a so-called backdoor on an encrypted data set. Now, there are there are huge questions about the differences between encrypted encrypted data in different formats, which is not worth getting into tonight. But I think, I think it's an open question and it's obviously an important one, but I wouldn't necessarily read everything, uh, trust everything you read in, in the press about it. Um, but I'm not sure if some, anyone else would add. <laughs> Well, I, I think we could also ask the question, um, which part of the company, because what we've learned this evening um, from, from all our speakers is that most people in Crypto AJ believe they were selling solid, robust, strong encryption. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, those claims were made by most of the employees, including the unfortunate Hans Bueller who found himself incarcerated in um, in Iran they were made with um, they were made with genuine belief and and a degree of honesty and it was only a small team within crypto AJ um, who actually knew the truth and so one has to ask similar questions about current communications companies um, maybe most of the assertions about end-to-end -end encryption are being made in good faith but actually What's going on behind closed doors? Yeah, um, so we've got a question here from uh, Sarah Richardson, which is a bit more about the sort of the, uh, the historical side of uh, digging up these facts. So have these sources only recently come to light and how reliable are they? <laughs> um. Well, I think um, Richard can probably answer this um, the best. Sorry, Richard, to put you in the firing line. Yeah. I think they are pretty. <laughs> I think um, from, I mean, from what we can say is that they, I think they are pretty reliable from um, uh, from what, yeah, from what we can um, from what we can see from where we've got them from. And, and certainly, I'm glad that the um, you know the, 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 the talk about in the papers in the INS special issue before this were certainly um, corroborated elsewhere and, um, you know, went through a peer review process. And I mean, also, it's interesting because, yes, OK, these there are new documents that come 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 across and come open every day. But if you look elsewhere and are a bit kind of sneaky with where you do look or clever with where you look for information, you can find it elsewhere. So, I, again, I would say they, they are reliable. Um, I mean, you know, reliability is a, is a spectrum, but I, I would overall agree with uh, with Melina. So I think it's a very good question because one of the first issues that our whole research team had to address was, um, was our data reliable? So we were working particularly from an internal 100-page history which has surfaced 
And the first thing we had to ask ourselves was, was it fake news? Um, so there was an awful lot of what we might call social science comparison. We were looking at other documents that were produced by the same people at the same time. There was an awful lot of mapping um, of what we already knew about this story, because as Jason's explained, other information has surfaced in other places. Um, so it's really a, it was really an exercise in, in comparative social science um, to ensure this document was what it genuinely um, claimed to be. Um, so our next question is from Peter, who asks, um, as AI techs are developing so fast, does that mean it's more convenient for government institutions to achieve monitoring on everyone? Or does the, the uh, sort of the rate of technological change, does that make it uh, harder, I suppose? So, you know, we've got a, an increasing technological advancement. Does that make it easier, harder? Um, and Peter actually has a follow up comment as well, um, which I suppose I think is around the amount of data that we're producing in our everyday lives. Um, does that make it a more of a challenge again to find the, the, the nuggets of gold that these uh, these governments will be looking for? I think certainly there are there are two sides to this. So of course, on one hand, the fact that data has been collected or that data is everywhere now, um, and we're feeding into it with everything that we're doing. Um, yes, it's of it's available. Um, so uh, yes, the data is there. Does it make it more difficult to access or find it? Um, sometimes. Um, I think if you don't know specifically what you're looking for. Um, I think needle in a haystack is a good um, analysis for that. Um, that, uh, yes, if you don't know what you're looking for, it's very difficult um, to, to sometimes make connections. But yes, uh, uh, in terms of um, the, the kind of data that you're collecting, yes, it gives a, a, a much better picture. I mean, um, I think, you know, even, I mean, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, no, Sorry, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say, but Saints Green Tesco knows probably more about me um, than than any intelligence agency because it's uh, it I, I go shopping quite regularly, so it probably can make the connection between um, what I need. I think you know the the petrol voucher comes through on a regular basis um, at very opportune moments. So I think yes, absolutely, um, it makes it easier. Um, but equally, uh, there are also now certain um, uh, challenges to accessing certain information. Um, I mean that uh, companies have different, um, uh, you know, di different challenges to intelligence agencies to access our information. Um, if the justification is there, then the information can be accessed. Um, if the justification isn't there, then it's probably more difficult. I, I think I think um, Melina's analogy of the haystack is very helpful because different countries approach this in different ways. Um, some countries collect haystacks and store haystacks. Some countries collect haystacks and only store the needles. Some countries only collect needles. Um, so there are diff different countries with different levels of resource take a, a different approach to this question that, that Peter's asked us. But one of the fascinating revelations of the the Snowden materials in, in June 2013, um, was really showing us how good advanced countries had got at the analysis. Before Snowden, I thought the volume of data was defeating the intelligence services. And actually, I was wrong. I was really surprised at how good um, big countries had got at dealing with the haystack problem. Um, so our next question is from Emmanuel, um, who also mentioned Snowden. Uh, so in the recent past, the American courts ruled that the programs revealed by the Snowden leaks were actually illegal. In your opinion, what does this mean for espionage? Um, I suppose I should probably take that. Um, <laughs> uh, what does it mean? Well, it it um, it means that. Um, what does it mean? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it certainly, I think, um, challenged um, some certain collections um, of, of data um, for, um, for intelligence agencies. Um, it has, I think, 
the biggest challenge that it has brought is actually um, public awareness of the fact that these programs exist has meant that there has been a certain pressure, um, probably not as much as Mr. Snowden wanted, but there has been a certain pressure on governments um, and the intelligence agencies specifically to justify these programs um, and to justify their existence. Um, and I think in the UK in particular, um, if we can speak to that, we've, we have recently had um, legislation come in that has um, probably made the collection of data slightly, even slightly easier um, in certain circumstances. But certainly it has kind of brought forward the process of, um, of, of the courts um, or the, or the, the uh, role of the courts in the UK um, to uh, permit certain types of surveillance um, in particular. Um, but yes, what has it meant for espionage? So it's, it's a very difficult, uh, difficult question. Um, a myriad of things. I could probably talk about this for hours. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, I think that's probably maybe the biggest challenge is that that there is a lot of a lot more awareness now of what what's out there and um, the challenge to justify those programs and those activities. And, and so, I think. On... Sorry, it's gone, Sarah. Oh, sorry, I, I was just going to add, I think on a practical level, for people who worked in those agencies, I think it did have quite a, a big impact. Um, if you speak to people in DC, Washington DC, who are kind of around at this time, they, they will tell you stories of, you know, things within days just being turned off. So whilst from a, you know, privacy human rights perspective, that's great. From their perspective, from their kind of operational, uh, tactical perspective, I think it did have... Uh, bigger consequences than than we than than we're able to understand at the moment. You know, in the course of time, we'll understand more. I think um, the real impact of what you know that whole ex that whole episode really meant for American and global intelligence. But um, yeah, I think I think it did have quite a big quite a big uh, effect. So, so really, just to focus on 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 the second part of Emmanuel's question, courts do have a big impact. I mean, we've seen. Um, the European Court having an impact on the recent UK legislation. And we've also seen judicial and legally driven oversight becoming quite important in the UK. There have been some fascinating revelations about the UK security service uh, retaining data and keeping data in ways that actually proved to be illegal. So what this shows is that courts and lawyers and judges do have real teeth in the world of regulation and oversight. So I think that links in as well to um, our next question. So we've got a couple of points from Angela here. Um, so I'll, I'll just give you a moment to think about this one. But Angela asks, um, if the power resides with the companies in terms of access to data, what are the implications for criminal investigations? And who has the upper hand in terms of data mobility in jurisdictions? We, we could take the example of we could take the example of um, you know major companies like um, like Facebook for example often have a single point of contact for um, government requests they're taking in requests from from all around the world and the simple answer is that those companies ultimately have the whip hand because quite often they're multinational companies they're not necessarily in the single jurisdiction um so it would be typical for um a company like facebook or google or microsoft perhaps to respond to 75 percent of uk requests they tend to be um quite helpful if they see this as a request that would further a genuine um criminal investigation but if those companies think the request has a political aspect to it, um, they're more inclined to turn it down. But the, the, the simple answer is that in many cases, these companies tend to have the upper hand. Um, I think I remember a, um, an example of this um, in America. I think it was the San, San Bernardino um, bombing um, where... Um, the FBI asked Apple to kind of help get into um, the um, the phone of the uh, bomber, and um, they refused to do to do this. They kind of said, "Well, no, this goes against sort of our privacy assurances that we give our customers. Once we give you this key here or help you kind of set this up, then it's not going to 
help anyone else who can have access to all of our products and such. So um, it, on, in the public side of things, we can see that it might have quite strong implications for criminal investigation within that. But eventually, um, over time, the FBI or the NSA did manage to crack the phone in the end to be able to get the evidence they needed. Just it takes a lot longer to get there um, for them. So in terms of kind of major implications, it might it might just be a timeliness thing more than um, kind of completely stumping investigations. Yeah, and actually the San Bernardino case is interesting because the, the New York court actually ruled in favour of the FBI's request, um, but Apple still turned around and said, no, we're not going to do it. So again, I think it raises this whole, you know, who's actually in control and mm -hmm. how much of our public safety, um, you don't have to talk about national security, but something like protecting the vulnerable online, you know, from, from, from abuse and from harm, how much of that is actually now in the hands of um, a, a private enterprise? Um, yeah, it's an open question, I think. Okay. Um, so our next question is, uh, what's stopping Operation Rubicon to continue running under a new code name? Are individuals and small nations ultimately powerless against hegemonic, hegemonic, I think that's how you say it, uh, spying? Uh, so I think firstly, I don't know whether we've spoken to how Operation Rubicon actually um, ended or at least how the Germans stepped out of um, the agreement. So um, in uh, in the sort of early 1990s, um, around about the time when we saw um, the incident with uh, Hans Buhler, um, the Germans um, sort of wanted to pull out of Operation Rubicon for a number of different reasons. Um, Bula was sort of the, the the last straw, not the not the critical one, but the last straw. Um, and uh, one of the reasons was that Germany actually wanted to just be a be, be uh, a sort of more central part of Europe and um, and be seen in a different light. Basically, they just wanted to pull themselves out of this um, out of this agreement. Um, and also, there there was a, a, a there were a number of funding issues as well around that time. Um, so in in that respect, um, Operation Rubicon actually carried on with the CIA um, until um, it was a 2018 guys. I think anyone want to confirm? Yes, 2018. Um, <laughs> just wanted to check that um, under CIA um, under the CIA. So it, it has it did continue um, until 2018. Is, uh, is there a is there a, a sort of um, what's stopping it from continuing to run? Um, I'm not sure there is anything stopping it from continuing to run um, in 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 that form because um, thereafter there were not that many um, rumors. I mean, I think the the B and D was tied to that um, quite easily, and I think especially around the time with uh, Hans Buhler, there were a lot of rumors going around that the B and D um, owned uh, Crypto AG. But um, yeah, the, other than the, the rumors and the potential for exposure, um, no, nothing, nothing much stopping them from continuing, I don't think. And, and actually, I think last year there were rumors that um, William Barr wanted, um, the Attorney General in the US wanted uh, America to buy Nokia to compete with China and Huawei. So, I mean, we, don't, we obviously don't know. Well, I, I haven't seen whether that's developed any further, but the, the appetite for certainly, you know, being involved with these companies certainly still seems to be there. So I'm, I'm not a conspiratorialist, but, um, you know, if, 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 you, if you're good at it, why would you stop? I don't know. Um. <laughs> no, definitely. And there are trends within intelligence operations um, throughout history where you, you see them repeating themselves all just with greater and better technology, um, like Operation Shamrock in the 1970s, um, the NSA would go and collect um, copies of transcripts of telecoms at the time, that they, we, because these telecommunication companies were like the um, service providers that we see today, whereas then 35 years later, we get revealed in the New York Times that um, Verizon, one of the biggest um, ISP internet service providers in the US, were working with um, the National Security Agency after 2001 to help them within their kind of terrorist surveillance program, um, as it was later called after it had been revealed. And we're seeing these similar kind of operations kind of continue 
throughout the kind of decades just under different auspices because of the fact that technology is changing and changing so fast. So I would say there's not much that's going to stop a similar style um, operation happening. Fantastic. Well, um, we are, I'm afraid, out of time. That's gone really, really quick. We're, it's after six o'clock already here. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's asked questions. I know we haven't even managed to get to all of them. There's a few more um, there which we haven't even managed to address. Um, so uh, apologies to Peter in particular, who's got a few more questions there. Um, you can uh, continue to sort of uh, follow the conversation on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, use the hashtag ESRC Festival. Um, you can uh, copy us in. We're at Warwick Engages. Um, and also there's the um, app Cyber GRP as well, um, which I will uh, put on Twitter so you can uh, tweet the Cyber GRP and they might be able to give you a better answer uh, to some questions as well. Um, but as I say, thank you very much for joining us. Um, there's plenty more events uh, still to happen this week, tomorrow and Saturday, and I think there's some on Sunday as well. So uh, do check out um, the website that's on the screen there. Um, but it just uh, leaves me to say thank you very much to our speakers. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, yes, we will see you all very soon. Thank you very much for Thank having you. us. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Bye.